Suit from the CIM program. It's an honor, privilege, and delight to have you all here. I know you're not here to listen to me, so I'll be very brief. Uh, it's a privilege to introduce Doug McGill. Uh, Doug is a close friend of ours. He's a local journalist, actually a previous New York Times supporter and uh, Bloomberg News uh, 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 bureau chief. Uh, Doug uh, runs a local meditation group, and I would invite Doug to come over and introduce uh, Ajahn Chandra. Thank you, Amit, and hello, everybody. Um, well, um, Amit mentioned that um, I uh, run a, a meditation group um, in a home about three blocks from here, and uh, we meet every Thursday night, and um, uh, we, we sit uh, quietly and work at trying to become more peaceful beings. And um, there's, a, there's a method to that. There's, there's a, a tradition and a lot of wisdom and practice from over many hundreds and thousands of years um, that teach us how to be more peaceful beings. And um, so it's really a great honor for me um, to be able to introduce to you a person who has devoted his life to learn that practice. And um, he's uh, Ajahn Chandako. Uh, when I first heard about Ajahn Chandiko, I was I was really eager to meet him because he's a fellow native Minnesotan, and he grew up in Minneapolis, and he uh, attended Carleton College, and I found out on the car uh, trip on the way over uh, that, uh, when the name Paul Wellstone came up on the radio, he immediately said, "Oh, that's one of my former teachers." <laughs> Did he drive me to this? <laughs> um, Did politics drive me to this? Um, so, um, and then I learned out, I learned from uh, chatting with, uh, with Ajahn last night that, um, you know, I asked him how he chose his path in his life, and he said that um, even at Carleton, he started to study Buddhism in his comparative religion classes, and then after that, he explored the world, he traveled throughout Southeast Asia and Tibet and India, um, and that he felt that there was a seed in him that was growing steadily throughout that period um, of several years where he meditated in different styles. Uh, Tibetan, Zen, I think he started off in Zen, then some Tibetan, um, different styles in India. And um, the style that really stuck with him um, was the so-called uh, Thai forest tradition. And um, he, he spent a, a good number of years um, in uh, forests in Thailand studying with some of the greatest masters of the Theravadan Buddhist tradition. Um, it's a third branch of Buddhism um, that's, that's not as well known as Zen and Tibetan, but is growing very rapidly in the United States, and, and, and our sitting group um, sits in that style. Well, um, as for the topic for today's speech, um, the, the billing is a spirituality and health, and um, I know that Ajahn will take us in interesting directions, um, and certainly this is one area where um, this art of being peaceful beings, I think, may have a lot to, to teach us and where we might have a lot to learn. And so, with no more further ado, thank you, Ajahn, and here's Ajahn Tanako. Thank you, I'd like to start the talk this afternoon with a short holiday chat. Tarang damom hi jarang anatito Bayani namom hi bayading anatito Mana namom hi manang anatito The meaning in English is I am of the nature to age I have not gone beyond aging I am of the nature to sicken I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. So the issue of health, physical health, mental health, well-being, how we live in a way which feels healthy, is a subject 
subject that from the very beginning has played an important role in Buddhism. If you look back to the life of the Buddha, when he was a prince in the palace in northern India, it was actually the reality of the sickness that made him start, really start to contemplate what life was all about. And there was a time where he went into town with his charioteer, his royal charioteer, he went into town. And his father had done a very good job of surrounding him with luxuries of his whole life. He was pretty much surrounded by um, beauty and comforts. And, um, but somehow they couldn't quite satisfy the inner yearning that he had. So he took a secret trip with his charioteer and went into town. And one of the things that he saw was the sight of of a person who was racked with disease. And, and uh, he said to his charioteer, you know, what kind of a person is that? A person that was um, deformed by disease, or his uh, um, body was attacked by disease, uh, discolored by disease, contorted. Uh, and, and the Buddha said, what, what kind of a human being is that? And uh, the charioteer said, well, that that, Your Honor, is a, you know, a sick person. Said, well, you know, what type of people get sick? He said, we're all subject to getting sick, Your Honor. He said, you mean back to the Alpha Dominion? Yes, Your Honor. And that, that was a, a critical moment. And uh, on a subsequent trip, he saw a corpse. They were bringing a corpse uh, on the way to cremation. Very still, lifeless. And again, the Buddha asked his charioteer, now what kind of a person is that? And really, he doesn't look like he's very active. And the charioteer said, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a dead person. So, well, what kind of people end up dead? So, well, we all <coughs> and that's going to happen to me too. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. And so, suddenly, all of the comforts, all of the luxury, all of the privileges that he had in his royal life started to take on a whole new appeal, a whole new lack of appeal, a whole new perception, a whole, certainly it didn't matter so much. Because the, the real issues of life seem to be much more profound than that. And so he couldn't, he could no longer justify just living a life of uh, indulgence, knowing that somehow the, the secret had been broken. We too are subject to aging, we too are subject to sickness, we too are subject to death. And so from that moment on, he really started off on a quest to see if there was a way that one could actually overcome sickness, overcome aging, overcome death. I guess in a way you would say he succeeded in that. Not succeeded in the way that we might think of uh, in a hospital where death might be considered an enemy, trying to avoid death, trying to conquer death, trying to conquer sickness, but in a way that is based around acceptance of it working with the aversion to sickness, working with the fear of death, and overcoming the, the lack of peace that comes with that. Working with sickness, working with aging, working with death, has been a fundamental part of Buddhist practice from the very beginning. But we come at it from a totally different angle. From an angle of, first of all, what do you expect? We're born, at some point, uh, we're going to experience uh, lack of health. It's easy to take health for granted, but uh, reflecting on the fact that while we are healthy, uh, it's actually a, this huge gift that we have that we can't count on having all the time, forever. So 
and why we are healthy, and how we're going to best use our time and energy, and why we are alive. It's easy to take it for granted. And who knows when the time of death is going to come? Another one of our chants goes, I am. Death is certain, but the timing of death is uncertain. So, if we, could, if we all knew that we were going to live to a ripe old age, then we could allocate our time in certain ways, but we don't really know that. And contemplating this, actually taking it as a meditation, is a form of meditation, Buddhist meditation that goes way back to the time of the Buddha, with the idea that it, having a realistic perception of mortality and the limits of the human body brings a greater aliveness, a greater um, vitality, a greater appreciation to what we have when we are alive, when we are healthy, when, and um, when that aging gradually sets in, then instead of it being something that is disappointing, frustrating, um, we think, oh, life was much better when we were young. Acceptance of the whole cycle of a human being is something very simple, but it's something that we've become very skilled in avoiding in modern life. It wasn't until I went to Thailand that I, I saw a dead body. But in Thailand, the whole relationship to it, because it's been soaked in Buddhism for, for centuries, the whole relationship is much lighter. It's not such a tragedy, and especially in the countryside, the villages. The whole relationship between sickness and death, um, there's much a great, greater sense of, you know, this is just part of life. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't try to heal ourselves. A lot of the time that I spent in Thailand was in, in rural Northeast Thailand. And until say, the last 30, 40 years, they had a very advanced natural medicine system, especially the forest monks and the villagers. There was no way that they could get to a hospital if they got sick. They were really out in the middle of the jungle. Uh, so they would have extensive knowledge of all the plants, the trees, the leaves, the roots. And that was just part of the survival techniques that you learn in that environment. And so there was uh, uh, a relatively advanced system for looking at the human body. But together with that was uh, very deep training of you know, when we are sick, that's not a sign that something's wrong. When we are sick, that's not a sign that we should be upset or be frustrated or wish that it wasn't there. If those feelings do arise, then okay, we're aware of it, we work with it. But you can get to the point where you actually see illness as an opportunity like the nature of reality, the nature of the human body is revealing itself. And if we have uh, clear awareness, clear understanding, then we can start to develop a lot of wisdom around just, just the human body. So when we talk about a life which is dedicated to peace and wisdom, the things we're studying, nothing very complicated studying this body and this mind. Everything that we need to know is available right here. And one of the main themes of investigation, just the human body, very simple. And we're surrounded all the time by sickness. We're surrounded by aging. We're, we're living examples of aging. We're surrounded by death. And and sometimes, even when we're surrounded by these things, we can't see them at all. Because it takes a certain 
willingness to open up to that. There's a certain uh, uh, shift in perception that is willing to look at these very basic elements of health and how we, how we relate to the human body, how we relate specifically to our human body, because that's one of the, the major shifts. It's, it's one thing to be dedicated to health and be very interested in sickness as a theoretical subject or as and something that's happening to other people. But where it's really powerful as a life experience is when it starts to happen to us. Or people closest to us and, and, and we're not to empathize with that. But the idea is to bring it in to our own heart. And then it becomes a very powerful learning experience. In almost all of the monasteries where I studied, there would be certain reminders of our own mortality. And almost every meditation hall would have a human skeleton in case. Sometimes not in case. Before, before they could afford a case, you just have a human skeleton hanging there. And quite often there would be a picture of a person who used to, used to surround the skeleton. And then there'd be a little sign that said, I was once like you, and in the future you will be like me. <laughs> As a reminder, because we look at a skeleton and say, oh, that's very interesting, very nice, and we study it from the view of fascination with the human body and what a wonderful uh, living machine it is. It's just it's amazing in so many different ways. And even the skeleton. But if you flip it around and you say, this is not just um, an external subject, but this is actually something which is, how could, how could anything be more uh, real than skeleton is not something that we should have in the future. We've got it now. Skeleton. We've got our skeletons in the body. <laughs> They're with us all the time. So there are many different ways of uh, dealing with illness in our tradition. And meditation is actually a very healthy thing. Now, in becoming more and more mainstream in Western countries, uh, because there is a recognition that uh, a lot of factors which lead to uh, sickness of various types can be alleviated through meditation, through reducing stress, and uh, systems of the body tend to work uh, in a much more harmonious, fluid way, and it leads to better health. And you can take that more and more deeply as well. If you go into deeper states of meditation, that has such a purifying effect, not just on the mind, but also on the body. Uh, man, there are many, many cases of uh, teachers that I've known who have cured a serious illness uh, just through their meditation. If meditation gets really good, you can actually go inside your body your mind's eye. And this is this is one thing that we'll do a lot anyways as a meditation technique. You know, visualize going inside your body, eyes, uh, just investigating what is the human body composed of. Because normally we just see what's outside the body. We view it from outside. But if you view it from inside, you get a totally different perspective. And then you get a more balanced idea of what the human body is. And I remember one case of a meditation master who he was feeling a bit sick, so he just sat down in meditation and went inside his body and went all around and then discovered the place where there was illness in his body and he had uh, um, some cancer growing in one of his organs and then he found out. But instead of getting, um, for in those days, what we call Western medical treatment or conventional medical treatment, 
he just used the power of his meditation to go right to that spot because at that level of uh, uh, development, he could go right there and focus positive energy on that spot and disappear. Not immediately, but, but, but fairly rapidly over a period of short time. Just through focusing positive mental energy on a part of the body that was not healthy, disappeared on its own. And there are many, many uh, cases of that, types of sickness which can be healed just through the power of the mind. And how you would explain that scientifically, I don't know, but experientially, um, there's just, um, well, we just know it's true because <laughs> it happens a lot. And even on a, uh, a lesser basis, you know, I know if I'm feeling sick or if I've got the flu, uh, if I just kind of give into it and um, uh, almost like accept it in a, yeah, a negative way or even um, have an aversion towards it, then it tends to make it worse. But if I actually sit in meditation and kind of radiate a brightness uh, in my whole body, in and around my body, it's almost like I can, uh, it just goes away. It just starts to go away very quickly. So the power of the mind is um, it's an amazing thing. And I don't know exactly how you would measure it or, or incorporate it into a system of medicine, but certainly there are uh, lots and lots of uh, instances where people cure themselves of disease. But even if you can't cure yourself of disease, <coughs> then disease is considered an opportunity, at least you know, in our tradition, as a monk. And then if uh, someone would come down with, with malaria, which is one of the most common of the heavy diseases in the old days, and even, even these days, uh, it's almost impossible to avoid getting malaria if you're living in certain areas. In the old days, say before 30, 40 years ago, it was mostly jungle. And if you were um, a monk, a nun practicing out in the forest, in the jungle, then you, know, you didn't have any, any uh, prophylactics against malaria. So you basically, you knew you were going to get it eventually. And then once you got it, you, you used it as an opportunity to develop certain qualities. So that's an opportunity to investigate the nature of the body. We're all subject to illness. This is not something that just happens to other people. It's mm -hmm. not a sign that something's wrong. It's actually just a sign that this is the way it is. And then it's an opportunity for developing wholesome qualities like patience. It's an opportunity for looking at our reactions of aversion, there's discomfort, and then there's a very strong movement to run away from it. You don't have to be sick to experience uh, the A life which is motivated by seeking comfort and running away from discomfort, it's just like being a slave when you're constantly being forced around, uh, where if, if you can get a broader acceptance of comfort and discomfort, and and it's not such a big deal. You say, okay, well, there's discomfort. Sure, yes, it's unpleasant, but you know, that doesn't mean we have to suffer because of it. It doesn't mean we, we don't. We, it doesn't mean we can't be peaceful, even if we have discomfort in the body. And this is where a lot of the, the training uh, to develop wisdom comes in. So let's say we we become sick. Okay, well, we can do certain things. We can take medicine. We can. Uh, uh, meditation to try to alleviate that, but still, we're going to experience uh, pain, <coughs> discomfort, and then when we do, and we experience any movement of the mind that says, I wish it wasn't this way, I wish it was different, I wish it was pleasant, and then that's an opportunity to just say, well, you cannot be perfectly content, even in the midst of discomfort and sickness? And the answer is yes, although it usually takes a bit of practice. So that's why when things are not going well, right, when we get 
sex. It's actually a, an opportunity that we can be grateful for if we have that shift of perception. Pain is actually one of the <coughs> meditation techniques that we can develop, which is almost seen as, as crazy by a lot of people. They know why would you want to actually meditate? <coughs> so much of life is designed to eradicate pain from our lives, to run away from and the fear of pain. Now just the fear, if we can overcome the fear of pain, that can lead to a huge amount of freedom that we might not even realize exists. Because if we have fear of pain, fear of death, fear of illness, then that can control our lives, constrict our lives, and, and rob us of a lot of happiness, even though we might not So sometimes meditation masters would, would sit for hours at a time, just allowing pain to arise. The human body is interesting in that even if you sit in the most comfortable position possible and don't move, right? don't move at all except for say, breathing, blinking your eyes, but don't move your, uh, your arms, hands, fingers. Experiment sit in the absolutely most comfortable position possible and then after an hour or two just notice what happens the body starts to experience excruciating pain if you, if you sit if you keep the body absolutely still it doesn't take too long before it becomes uncomfortable and after a period of time you, you start to experience intense pain the only way that we can maintain comfort is by constantly moving the body. It becomes so normal, we don't even think about it. But it's this whole process of avoiding discomfort, not really being at peace with discomfort. A lot of new meditators will find that sitting still for half an hour can be very painful. You get pains in your ankles, pains in your knees, pains in your back. And so if you find that happening, normally we, we encourage people to follow their breath you know, with awareness, be aware of their breath, you have their awareness established in the body. But at some point, the, the pain itself can be taken as a meditation object. Instead of running away from it, or changing our postures and moving, actually take your awareness and go to the place in the body that is painful, that has sensations that are unpleasant, and without, without trying to project ideas or concepts of knee, ankle, or any part of the body where the pain might be, just try to get as close to reality as possible and say, what is pain? Where exactly is it located? Is it in one place? Does it move around? Is the pain pressure? Is it heat? What exactly is it? And many people find that approaching their own pain in that way becomes so interesting, you forget that it hurts. <laughs> you just you try to get closer and closer to reality, and then you just feel those sensations of pain, exactly where it is, and, and what it is, and how it's changing. And before you know it, uh, it doesn't even hurt anymore, but the pain hasn't gone away. As long as we have enough of what we call mindfulness, like clear awareness that we can uh, be objective about looking at pain, then it's a great meditation object. <clears throat> what happens is that when the pain becomes too strong or we don't have enough clear mindfulness, then we just get sucked into the pain and, it's, and there's no objectivity anymore. And then it's either just green and barren, which isn't very productive, or, or we just suffer, and, and, and we identify with the pain as being me, or my pain, and then not only do we have the pain and the knee, or the 
back or from pain in the body, wherever it is, but we have a lot of mental pain that we add on top of it. And so this is the area where Buddhism, I think, really has a lot to offer. Because the physical pain, you know, there's no one in life who, who is not going to experience physical pain. But the mental pain is optional. And quite often it's the mental pain which is really devastating. If we can actually learn to be at peace with pain, and be at peace with illness, especially if it's a chronic illness, and we really there's not a whole lot we can do about it. We, we can we can hate it and suffer mentally, or we can accept it and go on living our lives. Now it's easier said than done, but but uh, it is possible. And there are actually you know, techniques and ways of uh, uh, training ourselves or by training our perceptions, uh, which systematically uh, allow us to be more and more at peace with pain and illness. Now, some of these meditation masters would take this uh, meditation on pain to very deep levels. So they would sit, say, normally we would sit for maybe 45 minutes or an hour. Really great, say for us, an hour and a half. So they would sit in maybe a half lotus, a full lotus position, and not move for four hours, five hours, six hours. And then you would start to get waves of incredibly intense pain. So if you're not moving at all, uh, the body goes through intense waves of pain where experientially they say it feels like body's going to explode or you're going to die. And, or like the body's on fire. And if you stay with it, if you have enough strength of mind to stay with it, it goes through these waves and then suddenly, boom, all the pain absolutely disappears. And all that's left is radiant joy. And then if they stick with it, say after four or five hours, it tends to build again. And uh, it goes through these waves, and each successive wave is more and more intense. And quite often they'll go through different, uh, you know, different levels that they can take. At some point, you know, it's just it's a very intense practice. And I remember speaking with one meditation master in Thailand. He said, well, in in his early years, when he was training with this, he went to his teacher and said, look, you know, I'm just having difficulty getting beyond the nine-hour mark. <laughs> but, yeah, I, no matter what I do, well, when it comes to nine hours and all the pain that, that I experience at nine hours, it just feels like my body's going to explode. And his teacher said, yeah, you're right, I'm good now. And I've got to break through that. And get at least 12 hours. Because there's, there's some very deep experiential wisdom that takes place if we view pain in the right way and we see how pain just absolutely disappear through the power of the mind. And if it just, it, it totally goes against how we normally think of pain. And these old meditation masters incredible confidence because they knew that there was going to be nothing else in life that was going to be more painful than what they've already experienced and that they had, had made, they made it through it. They made it through it. And that they can I mean, not just grit their teeth and bear it, but actually be at peace with this whole process of experiencing even the most intense levels of pain. So there's a lot of wisdom that can come from that. And there's a lot of wisdom that can come from just understanding how our body is composed. <coughs> so if you go to even high school biology class, you're going you're gonna to learn how the body is made up of uh, the different systems in the body. And I remember going to autopsies and the coroners are working all day 
looking at the insides of human bodies and they know, you know what it looks like and yet they don't seem to be uh, developing the wisdom in the process. But there are meditations where we can uh, visualize how the body is composed or uh, take the body apart uh, through visualizations kind of deconstruct it, and reconstruct it, deconstruct it, back and forth, back and forth. And then that changes the perception of how we view the human body. And it's not a type of meditation where we gain benefit through thinking about it. It's not like an intellectual exercise, because that tends to be relatively superficial. Even if we agree with a particular theory, yes, that makes sense to me, and, and I'll think about that. It doesn't really go deep. It doesn't really have the opportunity or the possibility to, um, to change our life. But sometimes just doing something very simply, we go through the body, visualize it, what it's like on the inside, and then some parts may stick out very clearly. Maybe it's a tooth, maybe it's a rib, maybe it's uh, not the heart. You can just visualize that dead body absolutely that part of the body very, very clearly. You don't have to think about it, but just you know, allow awareness to sink in. And somehow that gives our, it gives part of our mind more information than we would normally get. And it starts to bring everything into balance. And somehow, even if we just understand one hair on the back of our hand, I mean, it's just one hair on the back of our hand, but we really understand it. There's a allow your mind to sink into it and really see that, well, that hair is just composed of elements that are rising and passing away, constantly changing. Ultimately, it's, it's not really my hair. It's just part of this process, which I didn't really have a say in, in starting this whole process of having a human body. It just arose through causes and conditions and my parents and the things that I ate and the elements that flowed into the body which are constantly changing and it creates certain parts of the body and with one little hair on the body you fully understand how that is just elements arising and passing away not me, not mine and then that can give enough experiential wisdom to realize that well the whole body is like that and in fact not just my body is like that but everybody is like that So, you know, reflecting, contemplating, bringing awareness into the nature of the body is a very, it's a common meditation technique in our Buddhist tradition. And it's a very powerful technique. And if we're doing it right, if we're proceeding in the right way with a great sense of objectivity, almost curiosity, sometimes enthusiasm, just for you know, this quest for understanding, a search for understanding and wisdom, then uh, it has the potential then to really start to inform our hearts and minds. And almost without even trying, our minds start to go into balance. And a lot of the fears that we may have had around illness, around pain, around death, you start to gradually dissolve, fall away. And of course, when fear starts to fall away and we become more at ease and accepting of the whole cycle of a human life, <coughs> somehow it's just easier to be at peace with whatever happens in life and it's not such a big deal. So these are some of the benefits that come from investigating sickness, investigating pain, investigating death, and being at peace with the whole process. So the remaining time, I'd like to leave for question and answers. If anyone has anything? Yes? Um, <clears throat> how do you teach people to practice like the depressed? How do you see this working with mental illness? How do we teach people to practice? Yeah, what? you think meditation can help depression and mm -hmm. schizophrenia and all those types of things? Medi 
meditation is very good for helping uh, minor depression. If it's clinical, major depression, then meditation is not a it's not it's not a substitute for conventional medicine. But in combination with conventional medicine, conventional um, psychiatry, then I think it is it's very complementary and it uh, addresses certain issues that might not be um, fully addressed. You know. Best way? Go to Doug's house on Thursday night. You're <laughs> all welcome. <laughs> oh, that's tonight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Tonight. Tonight at Doug's house, um, I'll be teaching meditation. Uh, and I'll, anyone who's a total beginner, I'll just start from the very basics and give you an idea how to do it. Then you. Um, meditation really is a continuity of awareness, a systematic development. Uh, continuity of clear attention in the present moment. Maybe based on um, our attention being established in our bodies, with our physical posture, uh, with what we're seeing, with what we're hearing, uh, with what we're thinking. A lot of it is awareness of what's happening in our mental landscape. Because all the motivations, the fears, the worries, the, the aspirations, the things which are, are happening and going on, uh, they're, they're really directing our lives whether we're aware of it or not. So if we are able to bring awareness to that, then we have a much greater understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And, um, and the whole idea of where our life is going is not something that's totally out of control, but we can have a clearer idea of, of what our priorities are. So meditation doesn't necessarily have to do with sitting in a cross-legged posture. But in the beginning, it's helpful to have a reduction of sense, sensory input, so we're, we don't get easily distracted. So we sit still, close our eyes, uh, we usually sit in a quiet place, and so then what's left is um, we have our breath, we have sensations in our body, we have our thoughts, memories, uh, perceptions, future plans, and then we can take something, for example, like our breath, as a meditation object, call it. Uh, our breath is there all the time, whether we're aware of it or not, it's flowing in, flowing out, the sensations of the air coming in and out, or something that we can always bring our attention to throughout the day. Whether we're sitting quietly with our eyes closed, or whether we're shopping, even eventually, even while we're conversing with people and being active, we can still have that continuity of awareness established in the present moment. And that helps us to give a certain balance. And so any time that we start to go out of balance, getting you know, um, just too crazy or, um, or upset and angry, you know, we can catch ourselves very quickly and bring it back into balance. So meditation is a very broad term, but you know, before we can make everything into meditation, it's helpful just to learn how to do it you know, while we're sitting still with our eyes closed. And then um, there are many different techniques which we can use uh, with the idea of developing a continuity of awareness. <laughs> yeah. Is it possible for you to give us just a brief demonstration That uh, with people like that, it's certainly possible. <coughs> well, we can let's just say for a minute. If you sit, uh, sit in a comfortable, uh, stable position, feet flat on the floor, back relatively straight. Take a few deep breaths. Fill your lungs with air. Close your eyes so we, um, you're not distracted by other things. Bring your awareness into your body as you 
breathe deeply. Feel the sensation of the air coming into your body. And as the air flows out of your body, just allow your whole body to relax. The sensations in the face, in the neck, in the shoulders, the abdomen, all the places where tension might accumulate. Just with a few deep breaths, Breathe into those areas. <clears throat> Breathe out. Allow those areas just to relax. And after that, just allow your breath to be normal. Every breath will be different. Sometimes it goes more deeply. Sometimes it's more shallow. Bring your mind's attention to the sensations of the air flowing into the body and flowing out. still be thinking happening, thoughts arising, we get lost in thought. Every time that we realize, oh, I've gone off on a train of thought or memory or plan, then we catch ourselves and very gently bring ourselves back, establish mindfulness, establish our awareness on the sensations of the air flowing into the body, flowing out. Just the sustaining of awareness, conscious, clear, bright awareness of what's happening in the present moment has the ability to bring a great sense of peace, relaxation, being centered into our lives. you do this afternoon, bring that sense of peace and tranquility into it. <coughs> People say, what's got into you? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Uh, what, this might be a difficult question to answer, but in your travels and visits with masters of meditation, in, in your quest to achieve mastery of meditation. How much is self-discovery, self-awareness, and how much is actual instruction from the masters? It's a combination, because ultimately no one can show us or have us experience the truths of nature. Even the Buddha, who was a fantastic teacher, maybe the best teacher ever, he could give very detailed verbal instructions, he could give metaphors, similes, he could give encouragement, but ultimately it comes down to we have to figure it out for ourselves. So Buddhism is not, it's not something about just believing what your teachers say. Even if theoretically it makes sense, no teacher encourages us to just, to just believe because they know that that's not really important factor, not believe. Belief is not where the power is. It's, it's actually a direct personal experience of the laws of nature, learning how to live in harmony with the laws of nature. Even if it's just a very simple law of our bodies are gradually aging, and learning how to live in harmony with that. So it's really a combination of both. It's 
people who try to go totally on their own, even if they're very sincere, usually they tend to wander around and not make a whole lot of progress. So it's very helpful to have a teacher. But even if you, you're looking for a teacher, you have to be relatively discriminating in, in how you choose a teacher and, and what type of teacher you choose. And you want to choose a good teacher. And if it is a good teacher, then it will be a teacher who encourages people to, to bring the teachings into their own lives. So the emphasis is not on the teacher. The teacher is just a, a vehicle of encouragement or maybe have a bit more experience just through uh, having done it more years and then can share that experience and, and uh, sort of bring up the, the motivation, kind of send people off in the right direction so that, uh, so that they can start to experience those things directly by themselves. My perception of Buddhism from afar is that it's kind of a male thing, that the monks are male and teachers are male for themselves. What is wrong with Buddhism? Well, we have a nun's sangha, a nun's community. We have, uh, especially in the West, when we set up monasteries in England, we have uh, nun's communities there. We have uh, communities in Australia that are well established. And now there's a move to start a, a nun's community of our particular tradition. States. I'm not sure exactly where it's going to happen. Um, it could be California because there's a lot of interest out there. Um, but pretty much anywhere where there's where enough support comes together, uh, then that's how a community is established. Uh, we have many of our senior nuns going around and teaching the same way that I'll go around and teach meditation. In, I mean. Traditional Asia tends to be a, ten, tended to be a very patriarchal society, and with, so within that society, then the role between the, the monks and the nuns would tend to reflect that to a certain degree. But when Buddhism comes to the West, you know, the relationship between men and women is sort of unprecedented in terms of its equality. So the role of the, of the nuns and the monks then. Uh, it's very much influenced by our particular Western modern society. In the spirit of the scientific world, so when we learn through any of the courses, we are used to a structure, and, and quite often we get gone, quite often it's like that. <laughs> depends on how we approach it. Path of meditation and self-discovery. There is a very systematic way of going about it. Uh, many of the meditation techniques are, are very precise and systematic. And so if you have a personality that loves that and benefits from that, then you can get right into that have this very detailed framework that's been built up over thousands of years of experience. Immerse yourself in that. And it's not just a, uh, you know, it's not just a memorization of the learning, but it's, it's a sort of transformation of our own heart. But still, it's very much a, a system. There are other forms of self-development which are more uh, sort of free form. And depending on people's personalities, they may be more comfortable with that. Instead of having a very strict system, they would prefer just to go off in, in nature and have some very simple, basic guidelines, and then allow whatever realizations or, or development, transformation that's going to occur just to come from that. Your weather it's a or inefficient probably just depends on the individual. Like anything else, it's possible to waste a lot of time. Or daydream. You can, you can spend hours a day meditating just daydreaming about things, and then it's very inefficient. <laughs>
if there was clear, sustained awareness of why you were doing that in the present moment, then that would be taken as yes. If you know that, if you're clearly aware that you're paying attention to the sunset and it's happening in the present moment and uh, you're aware of the internal silence, you're aware of the feelings of being p at peace,